gadget since I was probably seven or eight, um, having a little handheld calculator, um, <clears throat> having a pocket radio. I was fascinated with small devices. And um, I've always wanted to have a small device that can do everything. I know it sounds a bit weird, but I used to dream about the future when I was a kid. Um, not so weird because I read lots of science fiction. And there were two things I used to dream about. One was about um, object <laughs> devices that flew in the air that had a camera and you could watch on a TV screen and control them remotely. And now you call them drones. And the other one was a handheld device that could do everything for you. And so um, that's why I became interested in mobile devices. Great. So now the time is for you to explain, show us history of mobile devices in only 10 objects. Okay, um, so firstly, apologies to the BBC and the British Museum for shamelessly stealing their concept of um, a history of the world in a hundred objects. And if you haven't heard um, the podcasts of that, then I really recommend that you go to BBC iPlayer. I think they're still available there. Um, so I'm not going to try and do that in scope. I'm trying to get going to try and get through history of the mobile world in 10 objects uh, and try not to spill a cup of tea over all these priceless mobile objects. So first one, okay, and this is a quiz. So there's going to be audience participation. So can you firstly um, pin the screen that says 10 objects? So if you look, um, I hope if you're not on mobile anyway, if you can look at um, the uh, screen that says 10 objects uh, and pin that because that's where I'm going to be showing the objects. Can you all do that? Mm -hmm. It should come up as a nice big red rectangle. So. Okay. So that. Go ahead, Menji. I. There's a window with the name 10 objects. Find that window and go to the top right corner where you see three dots, dot, dot, dot. Click the three dots and you will see ping video. That's how you maximize that Zoom window and see the 10 objects Mike is going to show today. So let's do that. If you've got problems, let me know. The other thing you've got to do is to get the chat window open um, because I'm going to ask you questions and because it's a quiz and I want you to answer <clears throat> using the chat. Okay, let's get going. So first question, what is that and how old is it? A bar of all soap. <laughs> a Weetabix, uh, uh, a granola bar, and a Syrian tablet. Writing tablet. A writing oh, tablet. Man. Clay tablet. Hmm. And how old is it? How old is it? 4,000 years old. 4,000 years old. <laughs> oh, okay, a cell phone. All right. So the answer is it's a textbook and it's 20 years old. Oh. <laughs> so let me ex let me explain. Um, it's 20 years old because it's a replica. I wouldn't be fingering a 4,000 year old um, Assyrian tablet, unfortunately. Um, so it's a replica, but a very detailed replica. I got it from a website in the US. And it's a replica of um, a 1868, 1868 BC textbook. And by that I mean, it's a copy of uh, an, uh, a tablet or, or a, large, um, a large tablet called stone slab called a stele, um, which had all the laws um, of the land written down on it. And this is a copy of those laws of just a small section of them. And it was carried by a scholar to be able to memorize the king's laws. So that's the back side of it, the front side of it. And it just feels wonderful to hold. It feels about the weight, a little heavier, but about the weight of a mobile phone. You can easily turn it over in your hand. Um, you could put it into a bag. It just feels familiar. Um, 
and I hope you can just about see the writing on it. Um, and the writing is with a stylus on that. So it's a clay tablet and the stylus was used to make those strange etchings on it and they're called cuneiform. So um, does anybody know what cuneiform is? Is it an early alphabet or a language from ancient Iraq or the first writing system? Is it A, an early alphabet or B, a language from ancient Iraq or C, the first writing system? We've got A. It's edible. Oh, no, it's definitely not edible. It's definitely not edible. So a few A's, a few B's, a few C's. It looks like a serial look. So the first right, so Christina, yeah, that's right. It's a first, so it's, it's not an alphabet, an A form. It's not a language, it's a writing system. And it uses between 600 and 1,000 characters to write words or parts of them or syllables or parts of them. So it's a really flexible language. Uh, and it was used um, from 3,400 BC right up to 75 AD. So 3,500 years it was evolved. Um, and it's a very flexible system. You could use cuneiform to spell out Chinese or English. Um, you could use it to, um, to write current day languages. So it's a writing system. And um, in particular, in this era, it was used either by scholars or for recording things like land use. How many tablets of, of this sort do you think there are in the British Museum? The British Museum has the largest collection of tablets in the world. Is it a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million? The answer ranges from two to fifteen thousand. Hmm. Fifteen thousand. Well, the answer, 10,000, 10,000. There seems to be a consensus on 10,000. Well, these tablets weren't made to last. I mean, some of them weren't even fired, so you could just erase them with your finger and rewrite them. So it's really nice erasable writing system. This one, this sort of tablet was fired. Um, there are, the British Museum has 130,000 of them in its collection. Oh, wow. Um, and many of them haven't been studied by scholars yet because it's very difficult to get access. And we had a project when I was working with Kodak um, in the late 1990s to photograph the tablets in the British Museum in very high resolution so that scholars could study them. So that's, that's the first object, a cuneiform tablet. Here's the second one. We're going to skip forward quite a bit um, to, um, I'll ask you a question first. What's the most important thing to have with you when you're moving around outdoors? Mm. Want to hear some creative answers. What's the most important thing that you should have with you when you're moving around outdoors? Shoes? No, there's plenty of people who walk around without shoes. So oh, your, sun cream. Your clothes. <laughs> You obviously haven't seen the naked hiker in Britain. A <laughs> guy who walked around the whole of Britain naked with just the rucksack on his back. <laughs> Occasionally got arrested, but no, he managed to do it. Water, the key to your house to come back. Okay, I will suggest the most important thing to have with you when you're outside is light. Because you can't see if it's in the dark and you've got no light you're not going to be able to walk very far. So, how do you get light outside? Well, up till the 19th century, you carried around a lantern. But the problem with the lantern was it didn't last very long. Um, it, it went out, it was difficult to relight it. So, um, the great invention in 1899 was the electric torch. Who invented the electric torch? It was a British inventor called David Missell. Um, who, like most great British inventors, then went to live in the United States. Um, and he, he worked with the Ever Ready Battery Company, and he invented what was called the, the flashlight because it flashed on for a short period. And it was just basically batteries in a cardboard tube with a bulb and lens at the end. The problem with the flashlight, though, is the batteries didn't last very long. So what if you wanted 
a, an inexhaustible form of light. You could have light wherever you were, came on instantly. That, okay? That is, it's not a wind up torch, it's a dynamo torch. So I'll try and you can, hope you can still see that the bulb isn't very bright because I've had to replace the bulb and haven't quite got the right wattage. When do you think that torch or flashlight is from? Anyone want to guess where it's from? What, what, what date? 1922, 1900, 1915, 1910, between the wars. Yeah, you're just about uh, right. Um, uh, so it's my grandfather's and looking on the web online, it's difficult to find out when the, there were um, torches with a pull cord from the First World War. But this, it seemed to be one with be made in Bakelite that was from about the 1920s or 1930s. I thought it was First World War, but I think it's the, the 1920s or 30s. And it's got Saja, S-H-A-A, and a very funny symbol that looks like, so, uh, if any of you know the Isle of Man um, insignia, Manx signature, but it's also like a kind of lightning bolts. Uh, I think it's a German company um, that made it between the wars. Now, the great thing about it is you've got light whenever you want. So 100 years later, it still works just as good as it did in the 1920s. Um, it still works perfectly. So if you want light outside, and in the, particularly during the Second World War, uh, it was really important to have an instant source of light. Um, if you were, uh, for instance, uh, army, or even if you're going around outside, there was a blackout. But if you went into, for example, trying to look at a, uh, a building that had been bombed, you wanted to have a source of light, you might have something like that. Nicked from a German soldier. He may well have nicked it from a German soldier. I, I think he probably got it from um, the, um, he, he got it from colleagues. It was uh, my grandfather, Grandpa Belt. Um, so uh, <clears throat> Jennifer will know um, Grandpa Belt because Jennifer's my cousin. Uh, so it was, yeah, from Grandpa Belt. <laughs> so that's the second one. The third one, okay. Until the 1980s, we lived in an analog age. So calculations were approximate. So if you wanted to perform a calculation, you used a table of logarithms. But if you wanted to be mobile and do calculations, and Gary and Wilma would know this, if you wanted to do calculations when you're mobile, what did you use? Slide rule. A slide rule, yeah. yeah. So that is my father's slide rule. I've still got it. Um, and you can see, so, and that, is my own slide rule from when I was at school. Hold it the right way up. There. Yeah. And basically, if you wanted to do a calculation, and again, Gary and Wilma would know this, if you wanted to um, multiply 2.1 there, you slid the cursor over 2.1, you moved this middle scale to 1, and then you multiply it by maybe 2.2, and 2.1 by 2.2 would be 4.62. So, and it had all sorts of, the one I had, had all sorts of different scales for logarithms, sines, tangents. So this well, I, I love, I love the slide rule. Yeah, it's a lovely, and it feels, it feels lovely. I really love devices that feel right. Mm -hmm. And this feels right, it's light. The center slides well, the cursor slides well. It's just so easy to use. And uh, all the different numbers are etched there and the scale is etched there beautifully. It's just I, a I delight think, to use. Also, also uh, it's very fast. If you get uh, efficient at using it, you can use it fast. It looks like it's slow, but it's not. I mean, you know, you yeah. can really, really uh, 
uh, use uses when you learn to really really use it you can do your work really quickly so how long would it wilma how long would it take you to do maybe multiply two two digit three digit numbers together uh probably less than a minute mm -hmm. wow yeah. i mean i i got i that's well, that was one of my favorite things in um in college was the slide rule i took a special course an entire course on using the slide rule <laughs> and and uh and I was, I mean, I was a whiz at the slide rule. <laughs> and, I, and I still have, and I still have the, my slide rule. Yeah. I think once you have a slide rule, it's very difficult to give it up. It okay, is. Okay, so here's absolutely. a question. Here's a question for you. So that slide rule, what about six, seven inches long? And it's accurate to three digits. So three decimal, uh, so um, right. three places, three digits. Yeah. If you wanted it to be more accurate, it would have to be much longer. So if you wanted it to be four digits, it would have to be about six feet long. Right. How yeah. could you get a slide rule? Here's a question for you for the creative ones amongst you. How could you get a slide rule that's about this size, but accurate to four digits? You could you, so use a chat. Make, make the digits smaller. Make the digits smaller, yeah. You could do, but then you've got to have very precise etchings on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. a third dimension. Nice yeah. Make it fold, circular, tied yeah. to a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> you, mm. They love the third dimension with a magnifier. Okay. So good answers. None of you quite got it right. <laughs> but they may all work, but here. So one answer is to make the rule in a spiral. So instead of having it laid out in a line, you make each of the rules in a spiral. And you do the exactly the same thing. You set the number, like five there. You move that top till it gets to, to the one, which I can't find at the moment. You've got to rotate it round. And then you slide it down up to the other number. And then you read off there on the bottom. And that is the equivalent of a six foot slide rule, all wrapped round in a spiral. And again, it was my father's, he used it. So it's a, it's a great solution to a practical problem. And of course it was invented by a British inventor, <laughs> Carter Formby King, oh, yeah. <laughs> who, who was a grocer and engineer from London who produced this Otis cylindrical slide rule mainly for business use from, and he sold it from 1922 to 1972. Um, so yeah, it should be up to four digit accuracy. A actually the etchings weren't quite as good as the one that I have. And so if you look online, it says that it's not quite four digit accuracy, but it's better than um, a linear slide roll. So that's the second one. That's the third one now. Third one, slide roll. Let me just see what I'm doing for time. Okay. My clock just stopped. That's not a good sign. All right. So we now come to the digital age. And um, Sinclair computers. So I said that when I was a child, I had a pocket radio. And it was a pocket radio that was... Um, manufactured and sold by Sinclair Computers. Clive Sinclair was a great eccentric British inventor who set up a company called Sinclair Radionics, who originally sold pocket radios and then hi-fi sets and then got into computers. Um, and um, many of you may have heard of the Sinclair Spectrum. Um, the Sinclair Spectrum was what launched the British games industry in the 1980s. There were so many kids um, in the 1980s who had a Sinclair Spectrum and not only played games, but also designed games on it. Um, and that kind of launched the, um, the British computer games industry. The one I'm going to show you here is this. It's the, can you just about see it? It's the Sinclair Z88. <clears throat> and Again, I really like it because it does one thing 
and it does it well. Um, it's a word process. You are ah, Robert. You had a Z eight um, Z eighty one. Yeah. So this so this is um, it does one thing, and which is type text. So if I can go back, let's see. Um, let's see. Not sure if you can read it there, maybe just about. I've written, this is a test of the machine. It's, it's just beautifully made. It's about the size and shape of uh, a writing pad and about the weight of a writing pad. So it's not very heavy. It's got the keyboard. And one of the nice things about the keyboard, as somebody who was sitting next to me at a conference said, is that the keys are silent. When you press them, you can hardly hear um, them being clicked. And the writing appears there. It's got, uh, what, seven lines of text, but you can then connect it up to a computer when you get home, uh, download it. And it became a cult. There are still people who use the Sinclair Z88 as their main writing tool, just because it's so nice. Um, and somebody mentioned the Sinclair C5. Yes, so um, not all that Clive Sinclair um, produced was successful. And his most famous failure was a Sinclair C5, which was when he decided to branch out into electric cars. Um, and he produced this electric traveling device. We won't call it a car, electric traveling device made out of plastic um, that you had to sit down very close to the ground and recline back. And it was powered by a sewing machine motor. And not surprisingly, it wasn't a great success, the Sinclair C5, but we'll pass over that. Oh, sorry, not a sewing machine motor, a washing machine motor. I beg your pardon, Ian, a washing machine motor. So that was a Sinclair Z88. That was, to, to my mind, the great success of Sir Clive Sinclair. Okay, next question. Um, as we're moving on, you probably know what this is. So it's a Kindle. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about a Kindle is that you can carry your whole library with you. So a question to you, um, when, what was the first ever ebook? Was there a first ever ebook? Because we know when the first mobile devices were, but what was the first ever electronic book? And she says, hmm, the Bible. Maybe a cooking book? It was probably for the middle. Bible. Something for the Define minute. Book. Define book. Um, okay, the first ever um, novel or non-fiction book that was published and sold as an electronic book, not as a paper book. Yellow paper. Yellow pages. That was a catalog, not really a, a book. <laughs> Peter Rabbit. Okay, I will show you what was the first ever electronic book. And that's it. It was in um, 1991. Uh, and there was a company, a, a startup company that was set up called the Voyager Expanded Book Company. And they marketed um, a few titles uh, in as electronic books, and I'll show you, I'll open it up. So they had inside instructions and a floppy disk. And you took that floppy disk out and you put it into your Mac Macintosh computer and you could read the book. Um, they called it expanded book because the idea was that you could do more than just read the book. You could copy quotes from it. You could see the progress through. Um, some of them had um, additional, um, that one of them had music, another one could read the text to you. So they tried out various forms. Um, the company uh, wasn't, uh, it produced about 60 of these different books, but it wasn't a great success. Um, and so it only lasted for about five or six years. But this is the first ever ebook or first ever published ebook. Um, and you can see on the back, there, published by, it got an ISBN number, published by Voyager. 
it is extremely rare. Um, I read on one website that there was only one of these in the whole of the United States. Um, so <clears throat> it's, and certainly it's, this is in perfect condition. So if any of you want to offer me a large amount of money to buy it, I won't sell it. But that's the first ever electronic book. Okay, moving on. We talked about famous failures. Um, to this day, the save icon on every graphical user interface is a floppy disk. Absolutely it is, that's right. Because that's what you're saved to in those days. So we talked about failures. What was um, the biggest failure as a mobile device? So what was the, the, the least successful mobile device? It's yeah, you, what you think was the, the least successful ever mobile device. The Sinclair watch, Newton, Cato, the Apple Newton, the Zune. Okay, some of you are familiar with the history of mobile devices and my nomination for the least successful mobile device is the Apple Newton. Hey, why was it so unsuccessful? Um, well, let me just show you it. So let's just lift the lid, show you the screen, switch it on. Can you see, maybe just about see there. Okay, and I'm going to try and write on it. I take the stylus out from the side and I write, let me try and write, hello on the screen. Hello, can you see it? Barely. Barely, barely. That's one problem. It was very difficult to see. I'm reflecting. But it's come, it's come up with hello and I will put right I am an apple. Newton. And it comes up with, I am an apple. Hey, it worked. It actually worked. It, so it produced, I am an apple Newton. Um, it became famous for um, mistranscribing people's writing. There was a whole episode of The Simpsons about um, the apple Newton and how it uh, managed to get text wrong. Um, so the main thing that it was designed to do, it didn't do it very well, which was uh, to recognize handwriting and allow you to write on it. But basically, it was a solution in terms of a problem. Um, it wasn't clear what it was for. Did you really want to laboriously write um, text on a screen, have it transcribe and then copy it? Um, it was slow, it was cumbersome, and compared to the Z88, where you could just type at normal speed, um, it was pretty useless. But also, it just feels nasty. There is bits that stick out from it. Um, the screen cover here, you've got to, it's difficult to get it up and back down again. Just everything about it was wrong. It had a stylus that popped out or didn't pop out, depending on the spring or not, and it was easy to lose. So just about everything about it was wrong, which is a pity because that was the first um, major introduction of a computer-based tablet, and it was a flop. Fortunately, as we all know, um, Apple got it um, right later with the iPad, but even a company like Apple can get things wrong. So that was the Newton message pad. Steve Jobs hated stylus. Well, he, he hated stylus retrospectively. I mean, this was his company that invented the Apple Newton with a stylus. It was only retrospectively after the um, Apple Newton was a great flop. He said, we should never invent devices that have a stylus. We have 10 fingers. We should use those 10 fingers for um, interacting with the screen. Steve Jobs left during that time. Oh, was that the time when Steve Jobs was away from the company? Okay, that makes some kind of sense. 
All right, next one. Let's press on because time's passing. What was the first indispensable device? The one that you had to carry with you. I mean, nowadays, you know, your mobile phone is indispensable. You can't go anywhere without it. What was the very first indispensable device? The watch, well, not indispensable because um, maybe the watch, a pager, a Blackberry, a Nokia, possibly a pager. Pacemaker, yes, a pacemaker, okay. I'll grant you that. A watch, well, one of the candidates is that, a Tamagotchi. Um, why was it indispensable? Because if you were a teenager or a 10, 11 year old and you'd activated that Tamagotchi, then there was no stopping it. You had um, given birth to this horrible digital um, entity that you had to keep looking after day and night. I haven't activated this Tamagotchi because I don't want the responsibility of caring for oh, it. Don't. <laughs> um, my daughter did though. Um, and what do you do when you've got a daughter who has a Tamagotchi, um, who has to care for it um, all day and is not allowed to have it at school? What do you do? <laughs> you give it to your parents. <laughs> I have to take care of this bloody Tamagotchi um, for my daughter. Uh, and literally take it to important university meetings. Um, and underneath the desk at these important university meetings, I had to keep feeding this Tamagotchi because my daughter wouldn't let it die. <laughs> How long it's lived. <laughs> so that's arguably an um, indispensable device, certainly for teenagers. Um, okay, the next one. Um, this. Mm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It is a Kodak single-use camera. Never call it a disposable camera. Kodak hated the idea that it was a disposable camera and because you didn't dispose of it. Well, you sent it back and they recycled it. So um, it was called a Kodak single-use camera. And you've got to think back to just before the time of digital um, when um, this was what uh, this was the funky device. This was a cool device, the Kodak single-use camera. You took a picture. It had a flash, so you could take it and the picture with a flash. And then you had to send it off to be developed. And it could take two weeks from taking that photo of your cool friends to actually getting the photo back. And of course, it was expensive. So um, parents <clears throat> said to their children, this refrain, don't waste your film. And so this was drummed into children from the very earliest age. Don't waste your film. Um, and of course, digital changed all that. You were allowed to waste your film. And that was the biggest breakthrough. So in the late 1990s, my post was funded by Kodak. Uh, and we had a project called Children as Photographers. And we were the first group to work with Kodak to see how children actually took photographs. Um, when I started working with Kodak, the Kodak website had a children's section, and basically the children's section was just about how to how children could uh, take photographs like adults, how they could improve the quality of their photographs. Kodak had no idea about how children would really want to take photos. So we did a project with um, the National Museum of Film Photography and TV in the UK and four other countries to see how children actually took photographs. And we took, worked with children aged seven, 11, 15, and later on three and four year old children. And we did something very simple. We gave them a single use camera on a Friday and say, you can use it in any way you want. We didn't even say you can use it to take photographs. We said, you can use it in any way you want. On Monday, we got it back and on Tuesday, we, we took it off to be developed and on Tuesday we interviewed the children about, um, we showed them the photographs they'd taken and asked them to comment on the photographs, what they liked about them, what they didn't like about them, how they might change them, what's in them. So we had a very rich um, <coughs> resource of children's photographs 
uh, and their comments on them. And all I can do in this time is just show you one or two of those photographs. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, let me shift. Share computer sound, optimize screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. You can see a black screen. Okay, let me just put that on the slideshow. Come on. Can you see a black screen? Yes. Good. Okay, I'm just going to whip through one or two of the photographs because they're so wonderful. Um, the photographs taken by children with that disposable camera. So what sort of photos do children age four take? Well, the answer is um, they take photographs of two sorts of things. One is something that's bright. So that's a lovely photograph of um, Thomas Tank Engine. And basically three and four year olds, they can use a camera. They can press the button, they can point it at somebody uh, or something. And they point it either at something that's bright or their friend or their mother. <laughs> so that's what three and four year olds love to take photographs of. How about seven year olds? So what do seven year olds take photographs of? Well, the answer is that seven year olds have their little world, usually their little world in their bedroom. And so they take photos of things in their little world, particularly things that they can pose. So, that's a girl aged seven from Sweden. I wanted to show my Furby. <laughs> so that was her little world. Um, and here, boy aged seven from France. I like Pokemon cards a lot. So, and some of them would spend a long time arranging their dolls or their cards um, or objects in their bedroom and take photos of them. What about 11 year olds? Well, the 11 year olds were the most creative of all the age ranges and that includes the adults as well. One of the first things, if you gave an 11 year old one of those single use cameras before digital and said, take a photograph of anything, they would try to take a selfie. Um, and we had quite a lot of them try to take a selfie in a mirror. Um, and of course, because they didn't have the viewfinder, they didn't know whether it would work. So they tried using a mirror to take a selfie. But here are some photos from 11 year olds. So that's a boy age 11 from the UK. Is there anything about the photo you could change if you could? <laughs> yeah, I would get more of him in, all of him. Well, I think it's just wonderful that um, just him taking off, it's like ET taking off into the sky. Absolutely. What do girls aged 11 in Poland take photos of? They dress up their pets. <laughs> it's a particular thing about Polish girls. Um, no other age range, no other nationality. I think I should have taken the photo earlier because the hat was in the middle then, because here it's falling off. <laughs> it's a wonderfully cool dog. Age 15, what do they take photos of? Their social world. <laughs> um, and in particular, photos to annoy. Um, and the great thing about um, those sorts of photos is you could annoy people twice. So you annoyed them when you took the photos and then you annoyed them when you got the, um, the print back and you could show it around all their friends. So he still doesn't know that I've taken it. By the end of the day, he will do and you'll be rather embarrassed. <laughs> This is amazing photograph. The more you look at it, the more amazing it is. It is um, somebody with a water gun yeah. taking a photograph at the same time as firing the water gun at the exact instant that it hits his sister. So it's just a jet of water. It looks cool in the picture at the moment when you squirt. Just, you know, if you tried to pose that photo, you wouldn't be able to. It's just an incredible photo. And this last one that I love, girl age 15 from the UK. It's natural. It just looks really natural. They're blowing a dandelion seed. So those are some of the photos that were taken. And we've got thousands of these photos, um, or at least I haven't got them now because I had to get rid of them. But I hope the National 
Film and Photography Muse Museum still has a complete set of those photos. Okay, moving on. We're nearly there. Wonderful. The next question. Who invented the multimedia smartphone and when? So use the chat window. Who invented the multimedia smartphone and when? IBM in the 90s, Apple in 2007, Nokia, Steve Jobs 1995, Microsoft, Microsoft, Thomas Edison, I like that, <laughs> you, Samsung 1980, God, <laughs> Cyan. Okay, um, so during the 1980s, there were there were phones, and there have been um, mobile phones around since the 1920s. Um, and there were also what was called PDAs, personal digital assistants. Um, and there were some devices like the Scion, um, which was uh, a, basically it was a, a handheld computer, but it wasn't a multimedia computer. For instance, it didn't have a camera attached to it. Um, it couldn't show video. Um, it couldn't show images. So in 1998, I set a project for um, students at the University of Birmingham to design a, um, a, a device that combined, because I was working with Kodak, a camera and a computer and a tablet computer, uh, a tablet, so a, a sorry, camera uh, and a, a tablet computer and a mobile phone. And <clears throat> these students, these amazing students, actually did some mock-ups. So this was one mock-up um, that they designed. Um, it's what would now be called uh, a clamshell, but um, so a folding screen, put it the right way up, folding screen there. So that was one mock-up they did of what um, a, <clears throat> a multimedia phone might look like. This was one they designed for um, children, and it looks pretty much like a game controller that you would have nowadays. So remember, this was 1998. And then they went on to do, um, actually build one. Um, and I'm going to show you a video now. And the video was from BBC Tomorrow's World. Now, for those of you who are brought up in the BBC, Tomorrow's World was the um, prime time technology um, program and went out on BBC One on Thursday at seven o'clock, as I remember. Um, and it was just compulsory watching for anybody who wanted to be up with tech. So they filmed um, this student project um, and we called it Handler. And I'm going to give you a video of it just now. Uh, if I can find how to do that, um, share screen. And screen and optimize. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, I'll just start it. Now, take a look at this gadget. It's called a handler, and it's designed to be taken on field trips to help children gather the information they need. It brings together many gadgets that are already available, from a video camera to access to the internet. And I can show you the video camera now. All I do is click on this bunny, who's the guide. I click on his eyes, which makes sense because it's a camera. And I have a little portable camera here, and you can see up on the screen comes a really lovely shot of me. And if I was so disposed, I could actually take a photo of myself. But since it's so disgusting, shot-wise, I won't bother. But Lindsay Fallow is in Birmingham with a group of school children to really put it through its paces. Today, we are going on a field trip to learn about the canals of Birmingham. Now, they've been here for a couple of hundred years and they stretch all the way from London to Manchester. Now, we're gonna split into two teams and half of us are gonna learn about the present and the future of the canals and the other team are gonna learn about the past. But the thing that's making it a bit different today is that each team has got one of these. 
This little machine is designed especially for kids. It contains all sorts of gadgets which will help us today. Access to the internet for initial research and then various ways to gather information. A stills and a movie camera, a handwriting recognition pad and a mobile phone, all in one. Right, who's in my team? We're going to do the present and the future that way. My group's challenge is to answer two questions. The first is to find out how modern canal boats are powered. The man who led the team which designed the computer is Professor Sharples. He's come up with today's field trip to see just how useful his prototype is. What's this? This looks like it might be a bit of evidence, doesn't it? Do you want to have a look? Hopefully, Sarah and Jonathan are going to find the answer we're looking for. And sure enough, down underneath the hatch, there it is. What does that look like to you? The engine. Excellent, an engine. My group discovered that canal boats today hide their engines under the deck. Our first answer for the personal computer. So what's she doing now? She's using a notepad with handwriting recognition. So as she writes, it gets turned into characters on the screen and then that can be saved or sent to somebody else. It takes a while to get used to the way of printing needed for the personal computer, but it's great for kids' writing skills, and once you get the hang of it, it's quite quick. Then you have a file you can keep as a stored record for later use in the classroom. OK, let's go. On to the next bit. And that's to find the answer to our second question. What are the canals used for today? Right, evidence of what the canal is used for nowadays. Oh look, the water bus thing. That's interesting, I've never been on a water bus. Anything else? Boat trips. Boat trips. Excellent. Do you think we should tell the other group? Mm-hmm. So how does this work? Well, at the back of the handler here, there's a phone card, and it works just like a mobile phone. You can connect up to a computer or to another phone. You can send data, or as she's doing now, make a direct phone call to the other computer. Teacher Mark Smales' group haven't started on their challenges yet. They're still on their way to another part of the canal that should give them the answers they're looking for. Oh, hang on, I've got a phone call. Hello? Hello, Claire? Hello, Liz. I'm freezing. I'm freezing too. We found the answer to the second question. Oh, great. What is it? Canal boats are used for trips and water buses. Right, thanks. Bye. Bye. OK, what have we got to find? OK, I'll stop it there. Let me just go back to stop sharing. That's amazing. What, what year was that? That was 19, October, uh, December 1999. So the project started in um, 1998. And as far as we know, that's the first ever public demonstration of a multimedia smartphone that combines a camera, a computer, and a phone. Um, and I've got here the second prototype of it. So that's what it looked like there. So it's got, you can just, hope you can just about see it. It's got a phone, phone card there. It's using a Fujitsu, called a Fujitsu stylistic. So there were tablet computers around then, um, fairly heavy but they worked, a Fujitsu stylistic computer um, with a phone card and tapped onto the bottom is, they're literally bolted onto the bottom is a mobile phone. Um, the first one that we used for that demonstration in 1999 was the very earliest, uh, sorry, not mobile phone, a camera. Uh, the one we used in 1999 was a very early Kodak um, webcam. So that was, that was it, the handler device. And that's probably the last time you will see it um, because it's uh, going to go to the National Museum of Computing in the UK. Um, they've said they would like to take that and all the documentation. So if you want to go and look at it from now on, you'll need to go to the National Museum of Computing, which is in Bletchley Park, the famous Bletchley Park, um, where uh, Alan Turing and others uh, decoded the Russian, uh, the German ciphers in the 1930s. So it's going off to that museum. So that's how, how long was the battery life? Um, quite long. Um, I seem to remember it lasting a couple of days um, on the Fujitsu stylistic. 
Okay, and last one, because time's passing. Um, the very last one, it kind of comes round full circle. I just wanted to show this. So I started off with um, a Sumerian tablet there. And I just want to show this because again, I like devices that are nice and simple. Um, so this is a tablet um, and it's not uh, a Kindle. It's called a remarkable tablet and it's from a um, startup from Norway. And it's just very nice. What it can do is it, um, you can put um, book, so it can be a, an ebook reader, but anything that you've got, you can annotate. So you can just scribble on it. Um, and as an academic, it's great because you can take a, a student essay, a student document, a report, you can annotate it by hand, um, and then it's saved as a PDF and you can send it back to the, to the student. So if you don't want to waste paper, mm -hmm. um, then you can just use this and it just feels right. They've spent a long time on designing the screen so it feels like you're writing on paper. Um, the pen, you can use it on the side of the pen. It's, uh, it's pressure sensitive. So um, let me just see, you can mm. choose different thicknesses but it's also pressure sensitive so that you can do sketching with it. Basically, it's a, tab a sheet of paper but a sheet of any paper. Um, so it can be a sheet of book paper for your books, you can read, it can be a sketch pad, a notepad. It, you know, I've said all along, I like devices that do one thing and do it well. And the Remarkable Tablet does one thing and does it well. So that's the end of my 10 objects um, through from ancient, um, ancient Mesopotamia to modern Norway. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And right, Minji, right, right. Minji has um, suggested that um, if we've got a little bit of time, because I know it's two o'clock now, so if you want to stay on, if any of you have got your own favorite mobile device, then please do show it. Would anybody like to show their favorite mobile device? Has anybody brought one with them? Christina, yes. <laughs> Go on, Christina, you go first then. You need to unmute yourself, Christina. You need to unmute yourself. Go on, you start, Christina. Unmute can you hear yourself. me now? Yes, yes I can hear you. Me. Yeah. Um, wait a minute. Unmute you myself. You're unmuted. You're yeah. right. Um, what I've done the opposite to what you asked, Mike, being typically me. <laughs> and um, what I've got here, can you see it? Is the oh yes <laughs> it's absolutely huge it still works <laughs> and um and it's very very heavy and it reminds us where we are now because this certainly would not go in your pocket <laughs> absolutely yeah i've got an even bigger one downstairs a murphy baffle console if you want oh, to right. that up. yeah i know it does remind you of how far we've come just in 50 years Absolutely, absolutely. Anyone else? Let's see. Oh, Raphael. Yes. Go on. Go on. Uh, you can just... I see you now. Uh... You need to unmute yourself, Raphael. You need to unmute yourself. Can you do it? It's not very small, but it's very mobile and it's very <laughs> important. It helps you very much to communicate with people. It, um, uh, you can meet a lot of people around the world with this. Uh, very interesting. So, although it's not very small, it's very, very portable. <laughs> so, this is your secret mobile device, secret exactly. mobile device. I'm favorite. <laughs> Sometime I'll tell you a story about I, I can't play guitar, but when I was 19, I went hitchhiking and I was told if you carried a guitar, people would stop. So, I carried a guitar with me. And I have many stories about um, stopping people stopping me and asking me to play the guitar for them. And I have absolutely no guitar skills, but I got plenty of lifts. <laughs> you should have brought uh, Raphael with you for that hitchhike. Absolutely. Anyone else want to offer their mobile device before we finish? Oh, yeah, Gary, go ahead. 
unmute yourself. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, Gary, you need to mute your, unmute yourself. I clicked on the button and it didn't work. So my, my device that I would show you is a ham radio. I'm a radio ham. I started when I was 12 years old and uh, I've been doing it my whole lifetime. This is a, a radio that, um, that I can talk to all my friends. But the thing that is impressive today is that I can connect into a system where uh, I can talk into a what's called a repeater, a, a device that uh, translates into the internet and then it will appear in Perth, Australia, coming out of the repeater in Perth, Australia. So I can talk to my friends in Perth from my little handheld device here. I can also do the same thing with my cell phone and it works, uh, I can operate from as a radio ham on my cell phone into remote devices. One of them is in Croatia and I can talk from, from my cell phone but I'm, it's actually coming out of a transmitter in Croatia and other places. That's my story. Great. Gary, you must uh, never felt lonely, no matter where you are. Right, right. Um, and I think I saw Joycelyn's hands up. Joycelyn, are you still there? Oh, and Stanley's got one as well. Okay, Stanley, I'm going to ping you now. Okay. Okay. Stanley, unmute yourself. Okay, uh, well... Uh, it's not so much like one object that I have. I've got like several objects of like over the past few years, I've been collecting like really old mobile phones that uh, probably my parents have or something. Well, these are, well, this isn't a mobile phone, but I've just got two here. This is like an old Nokia phone from like the nineties that my mom used to have. I think <laughs> this is another thing that my mom used to have. Uh, but I, what I quite like about this, always cause obviously cause I was born in the age when mobile phones were taken for granted. But um, what I find, what I really like about this is that it's really small. It's it's just a simple iPod. But what I like is that it's just incredibly yep. small. Uh, I've got like loads of mobile phones over here. I've got this one. This is just an early uh, touchscreen phone. Here's another one, and I've got several other Nokia phones um, somewhere in my house. Um, yeah, but yeah. In 50 years' time, they're going to be very valuable. Hang on to them. Yeah. <laughs> I will. That's right. great. But you're yeah, carrying on the tradition of curating little museums of mobile devices. Yeah. Keep at, keep at it. Yeah. I guess we should start to wind up now. Yeah. I'll hand back to you, Minji. Oh, thank you so much, Mike, uh, for such an... Uh, Really, really great session to start the year. And I wonder which object you will show in 10 years in the world of mobile world. I am now going to invite Ploy uh, to tell us what's gonna come for next week. So I'm gonna ping Ploy to make her spotlight for everyone. And Ploy, you need to unmute yourself. Yes. Tell us what Hi, everyone. Oh. Yep, thank you, Minji. Um, next week, uh, we are gonna take you to Thailand. Um, we have um Boy and Eng, who are sisters who have been in the tourism business for sixteen years, and they are gonna take you to Thai farm, to a Thai farm um that has the complete um ecosystem in there, and um you will see like Thai, um the rice field, um the lotus. Um, how to say like the lotus um farm, the orchid farm, and um the tip how to make easy Thai dessert. Yes. Uh, yep. Thank you, Ploy, for uh, introducing these uh, two sisters from Thailand and connect with us. So basically, these two sisters they're lovely. Uh, uh, Sixteen years ago, they set up a family business in tourism but quite different from mainstream tourism, just going to the beach. Um, they want to show us local community, 
uh, either a village, fishing village, or a farm for rice and lotus or goldsmith. Uh, we will have the pleasure to invite them to show us a very authentic Thai lifestyle uh, from a farmer's life. So that's uh, what we will see and experience next week. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope this is a nice beginning for your year 2021. And also thank you for contributing to our donation campaign. Um, in 2020, we actually managed to raise uh, 300 US dollars slash a little bit above 200 pounds. Uh, so we should be able to afford a website for our community now. Uh, Again, uh, have a great uh, morning, have a good day, afternoon, and evening. We will see you next week. Bye.